the Central Intelligence Agency was a bastard deformed child from the day it was born. And that's true. It has never outgrown the problems of its birth. Keep America moving forward, always forward, for a better America, for an endless, enduring dream and a thousand points of light. This is my mission, and I will complete it. This was a country whose whole culture was one of, hey, let's relax and have a good time and make money, and and uh, and the world is the world's problems are largely solved. The Cold War is over. What was clear to us as the Soviet Union collapsed was that the world in many respects was going to be a lot more turbulent and a lot more difficult to deal with than during the highly structured period of the Cold War. Robert Gates, as brilliant as he was, was trapped in a system that says there is only one main enemy, the Soviet Union. So the CIA felt, and the United States and the West felt tri triumphant. They won the Cold War. And as a result, they uh, lost vigilance, let's put it this way, because the enemy came from the other side. We'd been struggling with this uh, dragon for over 40 years, the Soviet Union, and finally slew the dragon and found ourselves in a jungle full of a lot of poisonous snakes. And the snakes were harder to keep track of than the dragon, and the snakes were Iran, Iraq, North Korea, terrorism, Islamic terrorism. And we were obviously adjusting to the end of the Cold War, which is exactly when Saddam and Iraq invaded Kuwait. I was actually in Baghdad uh, at the time, um, and I was in charge of the embassy in Baghdad. We had um, a number of indications that Saddam was menacing Kuwait. Late July 1990, the CIA and U.S. intelligence services warned the Bush administration that Saddam Hussein is poised to invade Kuwait. Satellite photos show a massive buildup of Iraqi assault troops just over the Kuwaiti border. He was sending logistic lines heading toward Kuwait. He was putting in fuel bladders. We saw this. They had satellites. They had electronic means of intercepting communications. But what they didn't have is the intelligence to understand Saddam. So all the indicators, things like movement of troops, movement of trucks, logistics, fuel trucks, supply trucks, things like that, that they were looking at, um, it was ambiguous as to whether, what Saddam's intentions were. CIA had tracked the deployment of his forces and their preparations for the invasion very carefully and had that very closely documented. But people in Washington, well, we told the White House that he's putting in logistics lines to Kuwait. He was sending troops. People in the White House, this Republican White House, remember, said, we know Saddam, he's just threatening Kuwait. They were listening to uh, leaders, the Rockies, the Jordanians, uh, the, and the other people in the, in the area who said, oh no, Saddam would never invade uh, a fellow uh, Islamic country. All the leaders in the region were telling us and telling President Bush, he won't invade. This is all a bluff to get the price of oil up. Mubarak said it, King Hussein of Jordan said it, the Emir of Kuwait said it. We were advised by or asked explicitly by other members of the Arab League, friends of ours in the region, not to do anything. And so the United States uh, took, it, took that at face value. So the attack on Kuwait was really um, a surprise to a certain extent to everybody. Not that we could have done much else to stop it. but. Uh, it wasn't for until the last 18 hours that the indicators began to turn positive. Richard Kerr, uh, who was my deputy, advised the deputies committee 12 hours before the invasion that in the opinion of the CIA, Saddam Hussein would invade Kuwait within 12 to 24 hours. Oh, I don't know about William Webster being informed, but we certainly informed the president. The disparity between what Washington understood and reality was huge. Because I mean, I was watching battles going on, and they were denying they were happening. I said, "Well, I'm not crazy. I'm watching this." I was on the on the satellite telephone, 
So we're watching the shelling, we're watching the tanks, we're watching all this stuff. He said, well, we don't see it. And on August 2nd, Iraq invades Kuwait, occupying the country. No one at the Pentagon heeded warnings from CIA agents working along the border. They'd even forgotten to tell the main man in charge, Robert Gates. I was on vacation. <laughs> and uh, we were in Washington State, and uh, we were sitting by the water. And one of my wife's relatives um, came to have lunch with us, and she said, I'm surprised you're still here. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, the invasion. I said, what invasion? She said, Iraq has invaded Kuwait. Well, CNN gets news pretty quickly. <laughs> Saddam invaded Kuwait on August 2nd. I met with him on August 6th. And uh, we met for about an hour and a half, uh, during which time uh, he offered up uh, what, we, what I called the deal, which was basically, you let me keep Kuwait. And uh, I will assure you of a steady supply of petroleum at a reasonable price. Uh, and I will serve as essentially the dominant um, um, power in the uh, northern Gulf region. It was very glaciado. Uh, I, I had not slept in about four days. Um, I had um, my own agenda for him, which was uh, get out of Kuwait. Our strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off, and then we're going to kill it. The Gulf War doesn't last long, with Saddam Hussein's army buckling in the matter of days. But the crucial question remains, should Operation Desert Storm be halted while the Iraqi leader is still in power? The CIA wants to move in and eliminate Saddam Hussein, but President Bush refuses. Before the first bullet was ever fired, we had explicitly told ourselves regime change was not going to be one of our objectives. I don't believe that we would have been able to put together the coalition we put together if uh, overthrowing Saddam Hussein had been our objective. In fact, I'm quite sure we wouldn't have been able to. But there were also the practical problems. Saddam was not just going to sit on his veranda waiting for the 24th Mechanized Division to drive up and arrest him. I don't think anyone would have, would have uh, shed a tear if Saddam Hussein had been killed along with the, the many troops who died in that, that battle. If Saddam Hussein walked in the way of a bullet, too bad. But there were limits. There were very strict limits on what uh, they could do in terms of bringing about the death of a foreign leader. We lit a candle every night praying that, we would, that Saddam would be in one of those bunkers that we hit with a, with a bomb, although we knew in our hearts he was probably sleeping in a school or a hospital or a mosque, since he knew we wouldn't bomb those. And they just couldn't find him. In January 1993, Bill Clinton takes over the Oval Office after winning the election against George Bush Sr., who is denied a second term in office. My fellow Americans, I want to build a bridge to the 21st century that makes sure we are still the nation with the world's strongest defense, that our foreign policy still advances the values of our American community and the community of nations. Bill Clinton's disdain for the U.S. Secret Service soon becomes clear botched CIA operations and judgment errors from the Bay of Pigs to the rise of fundamentalists and Khomeini, from the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan to Iraq's occupation of Kuwait, have tarnished the agency's image. Clinton finds the list of mistakes a little too long and decides to fire all the White House's CIA advisors. When he was elected, the first thing the CIA did was send two briefers to brief Clinton on the latest intelligence all over the world. And he sent him away from the governor's man. He said, Get, go away, I'm not interested. He wouldn't see him. That's bad enough, but what's worse was we knew that in the CIA. So what everybody was saying, that our, our, our main client, the president, doesn't like our stuff and won't read it. Shortly after taking office, Bill Clinton chooses a virtually unknown figure, James Woolsey, to take over the helm of the CIA. We have to do some things differently. I'd never had anything to do with uh, the CIA or espionage uh, until I uh, uh, went out there at the beginning of the Clinton administration. I had a meeting with President Clinton. We talked about the CIA job, but we mainly talked about what it was like to grow up in Arkansas and Oklahoma, where he grew up and I grew up. Clinton had an ingrained fear, in a way, of the intelligence services he grew up in the 60s. It was the time of beating up on the intelligence services. That probably 
gave uh, to, to his mind a dis distasteful taste about the intelligence and security business. He didn't really understand what we were doing or what kind of things we could provide for him. There are some presidents who are much more into the sort of underworld of secret services and, and covert operations. I think there, there are a number of explanations as to why in, in President Clinton's case it may have been less. First of all, we, the Cold War was over. That kind of covert operation that was so much the staple of some of his predecessors was no longer uh, there. And there had to be a whole new adaptation of the CIA and of the Secret Services. His decisions and his lack of interest, his lack of support, uh, contributed to the, to the weakness that brought about some of the problems, sure. If the CIA director doesn't have access to the president, he's nowhere because the CIA is under the White House. I had only uh, two meetings in two years. Uh, so uh, when in the fall of uh, 1994, when that little uh, Cessna airplane crashed into the South Lawn uh, of the White House, the White House staff joke was, that must be Woolsey still trying to get an appointment. Uh, and although uh, um, I wasn't happy with that joke at the time, as time has gone on, I've decided it's a reasonably accurate characterization of my uh, of my tenure. I did not have the president's ear, and the president was not particularly interested in intelligence. Clinton never met, almost never met with Woolsey, did not listen to his advice, did not listen to the intelligence. He wasn't interested. He was interested in other things. Clinton wanted to know the gossip. He wanted to know who uh, 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 President of France was sleeping with. He was more interested in, in extra extramarital affairs uh, than he was, I think, in, in what we were doing. Monica Lewinsky saw Clinton more often than Jim Woolsey did. Because Woolsey was never right. He came in with information it was always wrong. Clinton stopped reading those CIA briefings. He said I could get more out of the New York Times. Ask Woolsey about that. I don't think I failed at all. I, uh, I, I failed to establish a working relationship with the president. Uh, but on the other hand, if he had wanted one with me, um, he had many opportunities. I asked for many appointments. I, I think I was cordial. I was very candid. Woolsey basically failed to be relevant. He didn't have the personality, he didn't have the character, and he didn't have the grasp of intelligence that would have allowed him to go to Clinton and say, look, there are these big disasters shaping up, and if you don't pay attention to them, your place in history will be ruined. So. Woolsey was ignored because he allowed himself to be ignored. I felt like the perpetual bringer of, uh, of uh, bad news, uh, the, we, we say the, the skunk at the garden party. On February 26, 1993, just one month after Bill Clinton moved into the White House, a truck explodes in the underground garage of the World Trade Center in New York. Six people die, 1,000 are hurt. For the first time in its history, the United States is attacked by terrorists on its own soil. The CIA and the FBI blame each other for the intelligence breakdown. The FBI considers itself not responsible if the attack was hatched on foreign soil, an operating ground reserved for the CIA. The CIA, for its part, stresses that it is not allowed to investigate or operate on U.S. soil. Well, it should have been taken as a warning, of course. We could have lost 15,000 Americans in that first Trade Center attack against one building. And only a misplaced charge, uh, explosive charge, uh, saved us. The first World Trade Center bombing was a huge warning, and we missed it. The war has been going on for years. We didn't recognize it. I think the first World Trade Center attack was the wake-up call. We didn't pay attention. The uh, is Muslim, Muslim extremists have been recruiting in Washington since the 1970s. We were a bit uh, naive about the uh, determination uh, of the groups uh, to uh, inflict catastrophic harm upon the American people. We could have been much more um, vigilant uh, following that than we were. After the first World Trade Center bombing, they captured an entire room of Arabic documents about bombing the World Trade Center. And they did not translate those documents. There was one man who spoke Arabic in the FBI's New York office. They didn't have the money with which to, and he didn't want to do it. He wasn't about to spend his time translating documents. He was too important for that. The second thing is they didn't have the money 
with which to pay for a private sector effort to translate. And the third reason is they didn't think it was important. The FBI had the same policy for many years. They like to watch, to observe such people for a long time, because the, the longer they, they observe them, the more they find out about their operations, the more people that they can catch in the end. And so they wait and wait. And in the case of the World Trade Center in 93, they may have waited too long. Because the FBI is ignorant, it finds a new source not credible. This to me is just absolutely amazing, absolutely astonishing. And that is not to excuse the CIA, which failed to penetrate terrorism worldwide. But the FBI blew it on the World Trade Center because it is a bureaucracy and because it is a very naive, arrogant bureaucracy. It wasn't taking all of this seriously. Then comes the Ames Affair, turning years of infighting between the CIA and FBI into an all-out war. Aldrich Ames, head of the CIA counterintelligence unit, is accused of working as a Soviet mole since 1985 in exchange for $3 million. Ames is suspected of unmasking 30 agents and causing the death of another 10, executed by the KGB. Rick Ames was a loser. He shouldn't have been in that position. He shouldn't have been given access. They should have caught him early on. Aldrich Ames, who was known to be an incompetent case officer, and an alcoholic who was way over the top in terms of drinking, and the clandestine service drinks a lot. Ames was an alcoholic within an alcoholic organization. He was put in charge of Soviet counterintelligence. A loser, an incompetent, and a drunk was put in charge of Soviet counterintelligence. Now that tells me everything I need to know about the death of the clandestine service. The CIA conducts an internal investigation, but comes up with nothing. The case is closed. Convinced it has uncovered the worst espionage case in U.S. history, the Clinton administration turns over the investigation to the FBI. The Bureau reopens the case and exposes Alder James as a spy a few months later. It is a slap in the face for the CIA and a resounding victory for the FBI. We were not able to find anything, and we were not cooperating particularly closely uh, with the FBI. They were really getting nowhere. They were look, reviewing the same old pieces of paper, and they were getting nowhere. They needed to have an investigative effort. Then the FBI, which has the authority to work domestically against you know, U.S. citizens, then they took up the case and that's when they, they finally caught him. And then it let the FBI into the CIA, and they had this mess with counterintelligence where everybody's under suspicion. There's no question that the relationship between CIA and the FBI was terrible, uh, very hostile. They took the Ames case, the Russian mole, and said, well, there's hundreds of moles out in the CIA. Let us go after them. And they were let loose in, inside the CIA. The agency suffered, and it, it suffered very bad and much damage. It was very serious damage. I think that the, the arrest of Ames was the end of the CIA in, in a sense. The, the CIA I knew. At a time when people said, you know, who needs the CIA? This is 1994. The Cold War is over. Nobody had ever heard of Bin Laden. In 1995, the investigation on the World Trade Center attack points to the Al-Qaeda network and Osama Bin Laden a Saudi national born in Riyadh. The personal fortune of the man nicknamed the Holy War's bankroller is put at $2 billion. The Washington Post underscores the extremely close ties between bin Laden and the Saudi royal family and recounts how he was recruited, trained, and armed by the CIA during the war in Afghanistan. At the time, bin Laden had full support from the US as well as Saudi Arabia, which supplied him with the means to fulfill his ambitions. America was literally for many years, completely unaware that the Saudi Arabian royal family was funding terrorism as a price for internal stability. But by the time Clinton left office, he knew darn well that money was going from the royal family to bin Laden. They'd seen the evidence. Both parties, the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party, decided to tolerate this state-funded terrorism because the Saudis had the oil. That's why we don't look into it. That's why we don't spy on it. That's why we don't, we don't challenge Saudi Arabia on human rights. 
And they still stone people for adultery. Do you hear a word here? What we have unleashed with this policy of supporting an extremely repressive regime and, and giving them the money to keep, keep this basically sucking the lifeblood out of Saudi Arabia is, is we have fed the Islamic Revolution. And I think that is a geostrategic mistake of the first order. We allowed ourselves to become unethical and stupid over oil. Because if you take Saudi Arabia and, and you make an and you cause a revolution and its oil is taken off 25 percent, the price of oil hit $150 a barrel and this country will collapse. We act timid and with fear around that royal family because we're afraid they'll cut off the oil. America's political leaders and successive presidents turn a blind eye to the oil-rich monarchy, which applies Quranic law to the letter, but reimburse the U.S. for the Gulf War's $55 million price tag. Powerful American oil groups vie for royal favors and their share of a cake worth $150 billion every year. Several board members of the Saudi Aramco company are U.S. citizens. people who ran U.S. foreign policy are reliant on the royal pop family for money. You know, you just assume to be allied with American petroleum companies. If you're, you know, whether you take money from them directly or have their stock, you, you cannot challenge Exxon's position today in Saudi Arabia, for instance. They are buying the politicians and feeding the politicians information that allows decisions to be made in the favor of the corporations that are looting the country. Diplomats, when they leave the service, retire and go work for Saudi Arabia or for another Gulf country. And if their future after office is to be in the oil industry, then they should be disqualified for a post in the Middle East, in my view. The word in town is if you're nice to Saudi Arabia, you're, you're a senior politician, you can fly to Riyadh and get a million dollars for a speech. When Bill Clinton says something nice about uh, Saudi Arabia, you have to understand he gets paid to go make speeches there. That's the way it works. People from the White House go work for Saudi banks. They become consultants. The influence of corporate money, oil money, on American foreign policy is enormous. That is at the heart of all of this. The petroleum lobby is, is, is the important thing is you've got to understand is much more important than the CIA. You know, it's a hierarchy in Washington. And if, and if the petroleum lobby is here, the CIA is down here. And you maybe have State Department, and then you've got the lobbying firms, and you've got the consultants, and you've got the petroleum, and then the White House and Congress. By mere coincidence, Robert Baer discovers how oil lobbies are helping Bill Clinton finance his re-election bid for the U.S. presidency within the very walls of the White House. Bear runs into Roger Tamraz, the head of several oil companies, who has been invited to a barbecue with the president for the modest sum of $300,000, which goes directly into the Democratic Party's coffers. I watched this Lebanese man put money in, and Don Fowler offered him a list of services. Tete-a-tete -tete with the president, a, a night in a Lincoln bedroom, a ride on Air Force One, um, tea with the president, cufflinks, anything was for sale. There was a price list, you know, you'd go to a catalog. I thought he was lying. He realized very quickly in his first term that he had to listen to oil and he had to listen to Wall Street. The only thing I blame myself for is the stupidity, my stupidity, of not knowing the way the system works. Because what happened was, as I was sending in reports about campaign financing, the CIA doesn't spy on Americans, let alone spy on the President of the United States. I was passing information about the President of the United States to the director. And they were just horrified. Look, I was hired by the CIA to tell the truth, and I wasn't going to stop then. I don't, you know, I don't give a damn about the politics. That was the truth. I had really crossed the Rubicon River when I started writing reports about the President of the United States. It's not done in the CIA. I did this consciously. Um, I went to Congress and told them what had happened, not knowing the way Congress worked, but I, I had to tell somebody. And I told a friend in Congress, who, by the way, has since was found dead in a motel room. 
with a shotgun as his head blown off. That's another story for another time. Bob Baer decides to put his foot down. He testifies before Congress describing the weight and role of lobbies in U.S. political life and the presidential election, and the rather unorthodox methods used by Bill Clinton's entourage. The day I went to the grand jury to testify on campaign financing, my apartment was broken into. Nothing was taken. And the grand jury was thoroughly, they didn't even raise campaign financing in the grand jury. Not at all. It wasn't a word. And every time I tried to say something about the way the system worked, the U.S. attorney just cut me off and threatened me with contempt. She called a recess, she called me out, and she says, one more time you bring up campaign financing before the grand jury, and this court's going to hold you in contempt or we're going to send you to jail. And the system's crazy. It was dementia. Once they saw they couldn't shut me up, what they did was turn the investigation on me. It was pure intimidation of a police state. This is inside the CIA. And then the medical office came back and said, he needs a psychiatric exam. And so I said, you know, fuck you, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm not going to take it to psychiatric. I knew it was very, it was becoming Stalin-esque, because then once, then they, then they, what they do is they move you, they give you a psychiatric exam, a, a controlled psychiatrist. They can do anything with you. They can put you in St. Elizabeth's. That's the mental hospital in Washington. They could fire you. They could send you home, anything. I said, forget it. <coughs> Once this the politics had set in, because I knew I had done nothing wrong, I was understanding how the system really worked, if you're off message. And I knew at that point it was time to leave. Bob Bear resigns and is awarded a prestigious medal honoring an exemplary career in the service of the CIA. If it were legally permissible, the CIA would blow up my house with me in it. The CIA has located bin Laden, who has moved into Sudan. But Bill Clinton is in the middle of an election campaign and doesn't want to repeal the presidential order given 20 years earlier by Gerald Ford forbidding assassinations. In February 1996, Clinton signs a top secret order authorizing the CIA to use any means necessary to get rid of bin Laden. Believe me, if we could assassinate Osama bin Laden, we would. Clinton gave the order, kill him. They couldn't find him. Clinton wanted Osama bin Laden dead. They couldn't find him. The agency could not find him. One month later in March 1996, under UN pressure, the government of Khartoum decides to expel bin Laden and his secret army and send him back to Saudi Arabia, but the royal family declines. The Sudanese then turned to Bill Clinton, making him the same offer. The United States and the Saudi government went to the Sudanese and said, bin Laden is a problem. And the Sudanese were eager to improve their relations both with Saudi Arabia and with the United States. And they said, OK, what do you want? Do you want him? And the Saudis said, we don't want him. They didn't want bin Laden to come back home. They wanted him just to disappear. The Sudanese offered to, to turn bin Laden over to Saudi Arabia in order to jail him. They had to give it from one Muslim country to another. In other words, he would have been in jail in 1996, February. The Sudanese were desperately trying to surrender to the United States. Then the uh, Sudanese said, we'll give, them to you, give him to you. And the Sudanese said, no. Nah or the, the American side said, no, we, we can't indict him. We have no crime that we can charge him with, so we can't take him. And that's a fact. You had to have charges. You had to have either an indictment or a complaint or an arrest warrant. And as I recall, in 96, we were not there on the evidence to bring him back to the United States to prosecute him. And the United States put no pressure on Saudi Arabia to accept him. I know exactly when the meetings occurred. And they said, if it's going to cause you problems, taking bin Laden, we don't care. I'm quite aware of the correspondence on that. And then so the Sudanese kicked him out and he went to Afghanistan and we know the rest of the story. The American government decides to strengthen its counterterrorism cell, hoping to re-energize it. It merges units from the FBI and the CIA, two enemy agencies, into one intelligence service. 
It asks Dale Watson, the FBI's terrorism chief, to join the ranks of the CIA. When I said, what was the job? He said, I'm going, we need somebody to go out and work with the CIA. And I said, well, for your information, I don't know those people, I don't like those people, and I don't want to go out there. And uh, he basically said, well, you are going out there. And uh, I was forced, basically, as, as we later laugh about it, it was a hostage exchange program where people from the FBI were forced out of the CIA. And at the same time that conversation happened with me, there were two individuals in the CIA who were called in and basically told, one of you two guys are going over to the FBI. And they responded, I know this is true. They responded, we don't like those people. We don't know those people. We don't want to go over there. Because FBI stinks at counterintelligence. Its most important mission was to destroy the CIA. They talk about the paramilitary case offices in CIA as knuckle draggers, like they're baboons or something, you know? So that's how it initially started the cooperation between the CIA and FBI and counterterrorism. In August 1998, terrorist attacks against American embassies in Tanzania and Kenya leave 224 dead, including 12 Americans. Bin Laden becomes public enemy number one, a price is put on his head. Despite an annual budget of several billion dollars, the CIA didn't see either attack coming. It is even less prepared for a third one in Yemen in October 2000, one month before the U.S. presidential election. A suicide attack against the USS Cole in the port of Aden kills 17 American sailors and wounds another 26. The Clinton administration chose to accept that as minor attacks that did not require a major response. Those are things out there. They go on, that's overseas, that's not right here in this country. So there was a policy failure which said it's okay to kill Americans, just don't kill too many of them and do it overseas. History will reveal the failure of the Clinton administration to really get down to dealing with the problem of terrorism, of counterterrorism. In November 2000, contrary to expectations, George W. Bush, governor of Texas, wins the race for the White House by hair. Eight years after his father left office, George Jr. becomes president. His rival, Vice President Gore, bows to the ballot box results to save the American electoral system from discredit. He washes out the complexity and the nuances and I think convinces many people here, but also many people abroad that he is not uh, very well informed. I don't think he has the experience in foreign policy to do this on his own or the intellect to do it on his own. His inexperience and I would say lack of, of seriousness about um, the complexity of foreign policy. He has a tendency to simplify things. When you have a president that is a C-plus student and doesn't know very much about the world, you have a prescription for disaster. And I want to thank my dad, the most decent man I have ever known. All my life I have been amazed that a gentle soul could be so strong. Dad, I am proud to be your son. Back in 1960, before becoming CIA director, then president of the United States, George Bush Sr. created an oil firm called the Zapata Company. The operation was tiny, but obtained the rights to prospect for oil in Kuwait. The American oil man made a fortune. His son followed his example, founding his own Texan oil company in 1979, Arbusto Energy. But the firm was so badly mismanaged, it had to be bailed out by Salim bin Laden, Osama's half-brother, who bought a good deal of the company's stock at top price. The bin Laden family already owned the Houston airport in Texas. Before he was elected governor, George W. Bush was paid $120,000 a year by the Harkin Energy Group for consultant services. The Saudis held a 25% share in the company. The firm's attorney was the law office of James Baker, Secretary of State under the first President Bush. Look, I mean, George Bush, 
the older George Bush, the first president, made it clear that it was our strategic interests that caused us to go to war against Saddam. Well, what does that mean? The only strategic interest we have in the Gulf is oil. Secretary Baker said it's a very simple question. It's spelt in three letters, O-I-L. George Jr. made a fortune by selling his company shares for $1 billion. Two months later, Iraq invaded Kuwait. An investigation opened to determine whether George Sr. had passed on inside information while President of the United States was closed for lack of evidence. You have the President of the United States, his father the President of the United States, and the Vice President of the United States who've all done enormous business and become very wealthy in the oil business because of the relations with the royal family. And the people don't realize that the government that they're trusting to control crime is in fact in bed with the criminals. I can assure you there'd be no negotiations with the Taliban if UNICAL and Enron didn't want negotiations with the Taliban and had not been major contributors to the Bush campaign. The way this administration is, I prefer the Clinton administration. I mean, these people are, are crazy. The Bush family has substantial relations with criminals. I believe Dick Cheney has substantial relations with criminals, okay? There is a mafia connection. In 1989, George W. Bush joins the board of directors of the Carlyle Group, a post he held until 1994 without ever declaring his salary. This gigantic firm works primarily in the defense industry, missiles, aircraft, tanks, company assets, $16 billion. George Bush Sr. remains one of Carlisle's main pillars. The board of directors is comprised of a network of key power brokers who hold strong sway over political decision makers. Each partner has $200 million of capital. The Carlisle Group is headed by Frank Carlucci, former CIA deputy director and secretary of defense under Ronald Reagan. Shortly after taking office, George W. Bush signed a $12 billion arms contract with the Carlisle Group for a new artillery system against the unanimous advice of Pentagon experts who judged it unsuitable to the country's needs. The Carlisle Group probably has uh, direct informal access to anything that CIA knows about the rest of the world. No accountability, no shareholders. It is a great intelligence front. Now, I mean, Carlucci, Car when you meet Carlucci, you, you are at the center of American power. Carlucci can call anyone in the CIA he wants to and have them talk to him. His wife, his former wife, Marsha, his ex-wife, used to work at uh, an accounting firm. The, her job at the accounting firm was to hide the CIA covert budget in the Defense Department budget. It was all in the family. And nobody, uh, there are a lot of accusations that were the, quote, political firm, but nobody can point to any political uh, process in which we've been involved or any time that we've uh, used political influence. We do not uh, try to exercise political influence. We buy and sell companies and we make our money doing that. They do the covert operations. They funnel and launder the money through the Carlisle Group. George Bush is a business partner. Colin Powell was a partner in Carlisle. Jim Baker, John Major, Arthur Levitt, uh, there are public figures, but they're all these people uh, all have uh, business skills and they are in, we're involved in business. And I think it would be interesting for the public to take a close look at where their money comes from. The Carlisle Group, of course, has a lot of interests in Saudi Arabia. Bin Laden family, for instance, was thought to have invested in Carlisle businesses in London. So they were very strong ties. They were clearly a driving force in the very special relation that grew up between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. and with the Bush family in particular. Well, that was a very small investment. I think it was a million or two million dollars. And uh, we bought it back. Uh, we were not, obviously, we were not dealing with Osama bin Laden. Immediately after taking office, George W. Bush gets a clear warning from the CIA. Bin Laden is making direct threats against the U.S. Two months later, in March 2001, a U.S. government commission publishes a 150-page report that concludes with these words. A direct attack against American citizens on American soil is likely. Our nation has no coherent government structure to meet this threat. There were a number of us who had been saying since the mid-1990s that 
uh, terrorists um, were almost certainly going to use uh, some kind of a weapon of mass destruction inside the United States and uh, that we should be preparing for that. Uh, there were a number of panels and commissions and so on that, that, that said a catastrophic terrorist attack was coming. It was virtually inevitable. The CIA was screaming we are going to have an attack on the United States. There was a huge amount of information coming in about terrorist threats, terrorist plans, something's going to happen, something big is going to happen. After all, there were to be other attacks in New York in 1993 in addition to the World Trade Center. Uh, the plot to bring down 12 airliners in 1995. The plot to crash a plane into CIA's headquarters about the same time. Um, the, uh, the planned attack on Los Angeles Airport on the eve of the year 2000. There was a plot years ago to attack CIA, to attack the facility at Langley. Uh, and of course, periodically, there are threats against the White House and Capitol Hill. Somebody will drive a car up and, you know, threaten to do something. We were quite convinced uh, that America would be attacked. Uh, and we knew the gravity of the situation. And unfortunately, while the politicians all shook their heads, uh, wisely, in agreement, uh, no one did anything. The whole country was essentially asleep. Despite increasingly specific threats, infighting between the CIA and the FBI persists. Both agencies fuel the rivalry, continuing to hold back information. The head of the FBI warns his agents not to share any information with the CIA. It appears there were some mistakes made, lack of exchange of information between agencies and such forth. It was not a question of keeping secrets. It was a question of not having the facility to send information to CIA. They don't communicate very well. Their computers don't talk to each other. Their people don't train together. Their people don't work together. Each side, when it has information, tends to kind of keep it to itself. And they don't quite trust each other. It's not a question of fighting. It's uh, having different agencies with different missions and different cultures. There was a war, but largely carried out in the counterintelligence area. In February 2001, Israel warns the CIA, terrorists are going to hijack one or several commercial aircraft and use them as weapons. King Abdallah of Jordan, President Mubarak, and Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder passed the same warning onto the Pentagon. There will be an attack on American soil in the near future using commercial planes. For a number of years, Islamic extremists have been trained in how to hijack a passenger aircraft, an old one on the ground there that you can see with commercial satellite photography, and they're trained in groups of four and five how to hijack such an aircraft with, among other things, very short knives. I sent an email to the CIA in 1998 on Khalid Sheikh Mohammed about hijackings and the aliases he was using. He was traveling around Europe. I never got a response. Some people from uh uh, Arab countries were, were studying flight training and they were not interested in learning how to land. There were things like that that clearly called for more investigation. Can you imagine instructing a guy who's supposed to go off to learn how to, how to be in an airplane and that he tells his, 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 his pilot instructor, I'm only trying to turn left and right? I mean, come on. We received a number of leads that we literally did not take seriously. A young man walked into the FBI office in Newark, New Jersey, a year ago, prior, a year prior to 911, and told him, told the FBI that there was a plan to use planes to fly into the World Trade Center. The FBI could not verify any aspect of this story, and so rather than taking it seriously and understanding there was a great deal they did not know, as well as a great deal that the CIA was not telling them, the FBI dismissed the story. They probably thought that these hijackers were planning a simple old-fashioned hijack of the plane where you, you make demands. They probably did not know for sure that they planned to use the airplane as a bomb, as a missile. So they, they, they waited and waited and then it was too late. It's just like the information on Zachariah Musawi. On the 24th of August, DST, French intelligence, gave the legal attaché for the FBI in Paris a document showing that Musawi was involved with al-Qaeda. 
des informations transmises. On le sait aujourd'hui, il était quand même relativement précise, notamment sur le fait que Moussaoui s'était entraîné dans l'Afghanistan, dans tel camp, euh, contre les camps de l'Afghanistan. Euh, on savait également qu'il avait été en relation en Europe avec les dirigeants et les membres de l'Al-Qaïda. On avait nommé qu'on avait dit 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 FBI agents dans Minneapolis où Moussaoui était opérant Not only were they keeping the stuff from Minneapolis going to the top of the FBI, the top of the FBI was keeping it from getting down to them. The man in charge of the office in Minneapolis is like a prince, a little king, a baron. And he only sends to headquarters in Washington what he wants to send. Le FBI a jugé au moins un autre que les éléments transmis par les Français. The FBI decided that the information passed on by the French about Moussaoui was insufficient and didn't deserve further investigation or setting up wiretaps. The French gave it to the United States. The Americans said, that's not important. They didn't put taps on his phone. They didn't get into his computer. They don't listen. You know, everybody says, oh, it's the FBI's fault. It's the CIA's fault. Well, when the president's team is telling you, don't look over there for trouble, we don't want to know if there's trouble over there. We don't want to see it. We don't want to hear it. The Saudis are our friends. What are the intelligence people supposed to do? The real intelligence failure was that CIA was not conducting operations in Saudi Arabia. It was understood that the Saudis were our friends and that we were not to spy on our friends. The king is sending a message. He doesn't want to know. In this case, the king was George W. Bush or the assistant king, uh, Dick Cheney. But the reality is they did not let our intelligence forces do their job. Maybe, just maybe, if we had let the organization do its business properly, it might have stopped September 11th. Five years after quitting the CIA, Robert Baird decides to make a private visit to the Persian Gulf to reestablish contact with the groups he had infiltrated and gather information about the upcoming attack. I became very close to a dissident group in the Gulf that was aware of these plans. So when I went, re resigned from the CIA, did not retire, I went to Beirut, and simply being on the ground, these people told me that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was planning hijackings. It was the old Ramzi Yusuf group that blew up the World Trade Center. He was telling the president in August of 2001, we're going to have a terrorist incident inside the United States. I knew the CIA wasn't going to listen because they, they had decided nothing was going to happen. And this is the way it works. If they decide nothing's going to happen in the bureaucracy, then they don't want to hear any, any views outside. We failed to thoroughly examine all of those documents and to understand that they would keep coming back, only their plans would get bigger. So whether it was the FBI's fault or the CIA's fault, regardless of how you want to put blame, it wasn't done well in that center. You know, putting money into incompetence is like adding gasoline to a fire. That's what happened. Everybody wants to talk about it as a complex of, oh my God, these people were geniuses and complex. Nonsense. It was done by a bunch of fools. But we couldn't imagine that, that they would have that much capability and that many people willing to commit suicide and, and, and set up a structure like that. We missed it entirely. The morning of September 11th finds George W. Bush in Florida taking his daily jog. He has just ended a five-week vacation on his Texas ranch. His brother, Florida's governor invited him to kick off his new education campaign in the state. The president is kidding around with reporters. In an hour, he'll visit a school in Sarasota. At 8.47 a.m., while the president jokes with the kids, his advisor gets a telephone call.
past. Discover the roots.